play and ready. Mm-hmm. Perfect. Hi, everyone, and welcome to an exciting new webinar hosted by the STEAM team. My name is Rashmina William, and I have the honor of being one of the STEAM team co-chairs. Uh, the STEAM team is a AAAS Science, Technology, and Policy Fellowship Affinity Group. Our goal is to empower communities typically underrepresented in STEAM to be a part of the scientific narrative through activities that encourage community engagement, foster clear scientific communication, and promote science storytelling. We are delighted to have Dr. Miller here with us tonight to help promote these important goals within the context of combating vaccine hesitancy. His talk continues a series of excellent webinars already freely available on our YouTube channel and website. And I encourage all of you to like and subscribe so that you can stay up to date on our future events. With that, thank you all for listening in and I will turn it over to Mabel to introduce our speaker for this evening. Okay, well, thank you all for joining us tonight. We are very excited to have Dr. Michael Miller talk about vaccine misinformation and the rise of anti-science sentiment. Um, Dr. Miller is a healthcare and life sciences communication policy expert with over 30 years of experience working to improve healthcare access. And he was the first uh, AAAS executive branch fellow at the White House's Office of Management and Budget. And um, after the fellowship, Dr. Miller worked on AIDS policy at the NIH, and he also spent about three years working for former Representative Sander Levin on the Ways and Means Committee, and then um, five years on Pfizer's Washington, D.C. office. And since 2000, he has been mostly consulting on his own, working with large and small organizations, private companies, and governmental organizations. Um, since 2020, Dr. Miller has spent a majority of his time focusing on vaccine confidence and misinformation, and he was in the board of directors of the nonprofit White We Vax, and he still manages their scientific advisory board. Um, and to not keep uh, or to not take the entire hour uh, with all of uh, Dr. Miller's accomplishments and uh, many roles he's had since he was a fellow, um, I'm, I'm going to hand it off to you. <laughs> and to um, talk to us a little bit more about vaccine he- hesitancy, and then we'll do a, a Q&A at the end of the uh, yeah. presentation. Um, so uh, at that moment, if you have questions, feel free to unmute yourself and um, engage in a conversation with Dr. Miller. Yeah, thanks, Mabel. Um, I've got some slides to share, and, and I'm going to talk for... Um, 15, 20 minutes about some things about misinformation. Let me figure out how to get to the right thing and then do this and do this so I can look at the... Did Dr. Miller freeze? Yeah, I think he might have. Mabel, you were muted, so I didn't hear you. But um, yeah, I think. Oh, yeah, got it. I do that all the time. I, I yeah, I think so. I think we lost him for a little. Okay. Hopefully. Um... Oh, hopefully he's. <laughs> Yeah. I'm going to stop the recording for a bit. Slideshow. I got it for recording. No, I didn't want to do that. Shoot. Um, can you guys see okay? It's it's I, yeah. I hit the wrong I hit the wrong yeah. button. We can see your screen just fine. It's on the Hang slide on that says goals for today. Hang on a sec. Let me um do this again. There we go. All right. Um, that's my my. Here we go. 
So we're going to talk about vaccine misinformation and and uh, science misinformation. Thank you guys for having me here. I apologize sincerely for the technical glitch. Um, it always happens at the worst time, right? So my goals today, I'm going to talk for 50, about 15 minutes or so about why people get misinformed, a little about misinformation, disinformation, what can be done about misinformation, and what misinformation means for people and countries and society. That'll come out a little bit in the discussion. And then I want to leave a lot of time for Q&A. So I'm going to do a little bit of intro. Mabel will introduce me. I'll give a little more uh, texture to that. I feel the need just to talk a little bit about vaccines and COVID just for level setting. I know we've all been living through it and probably people on this call have been much more enmeshed in learning about it and following it and understanding it than most, but you can do that. And really the two things I'm gonna talk about most are why people become misinformed and the sources of misinformation. And then a little bit about how to address misinformation, both sort of professionally and personally and policy-wise. So this is a little more of an introduction about me. I grew up in Connecticut. I've lived all over DC, Boston, back to DC. I'm now in the Northern Berkshires. I am a physician by original training, but I've been doing this policy communications work for 30 years. As Mabel said, I've worked for a lot of different big companies, small companies, I'm doing more and more advocacy work, work with patient advocacies and entrepreneurs. For those of you in DC, uh, Bread for the City is a free clinic and uh, community service organization. I was a volunteer doc there for years and on their board. Since about 2000, I've been a solo consultant, and this is my disclaimer right now. I'm not affiliated or under contract with any healthcare or biopharma company. In the last 20 years, I've been focusing more and more on communications, and now particularly doing a lot of work on communications, coaching, and training, helping people with their public speaking. I call it speech, uh, speech and presentation coaching. So that's my little marketing pitch. And as Mabel said, for the last 20, 24 months, I've been doing a lot of work related to COVID vaccine, vaccine, vaccine confidence and misinformation, and through this organization called Why We Vax. Uh, just a little level setting on vaccines and COVID-19. The goal has always been returning to normal or normal-ish. Let me move this over here. Um, which really, you know, a year, a year ago, we we're trying to get vaccines and the goal was herd immunity and everything else. We're clearly not getting there. We're gonna get something called effective control. And we're moving from the pandemic to something endemic, SARS-CoV-2 virus. Now the president said the pandemic's over. You know, there's no real hard and fast definition, but a year ago people were shooting at, let's try and get, you know, good control or moderately good control it might be something like influenza which has about 100 deaths per day on average across the year in an average year. It's about 30,000 deaths per, per year. Right now, we're at about 400 deaths per day from COVID. So we're clearly not at that level. There are some cases to be made about the accuracy of data, both for COVID and for flu historically, but we're still kind of high, particularly if COVID becomes seasonal like flu, where it's more prevalent and more uh, significant in the winter. We're not starting at a very low place. I also want to point out that vaccine resistance and misinformation is not just about COVID vaccine. It's flu vaccine, measles, mumps, rubella, other things. And as the title says, it's the whole science misinformation and discussion on that. We can talk more about how it's bled over into all sorts of other things um, in the Q&A. So I also think since we're scientists and we deal in a scientific world, we should think about metrics. And the other metrics for are we returning to normal-ish? Is the healthcare system capable of dealing with sort of normal delivery? Because you know it got so places got so overwhelmed with COVID, they were shutting down, not doing anything else. What's the vaccine rates? Um, do we have immunity? One thing that science is still working on is called a correlate of protection, basically a blood test to say you've got adequate immunity, like you can get from measles, mumps, and rubella. We have made testing easy and available. Treatments are relatively easy and relatively available. The one big area they're still working on, and I know a bunch of you are at NIH, uh, is long COVID. I know there's a technical name for it that's not long COVID, but that's what everybody's calling. Uh, and then the case numbers and death numbers. So let's get into the meat of the matter about mis and disinformation. If you guys take nothing away from this, I want you to remember two things, I want you to four things, and here's the first two. The reason people are susceptible or can get easily misinformed and believe of you know false information is a combination of a strong personal sense of autonomy. They get to choose 
it's their personal rights, um, and a mistrust in basically big organizations. It can be government, can be companies, their employer, can be the healthcare system, can be pharma companies, can be media. Uh, where where their mistrust is is directed towards can vary by by individual, by demographics, a lot of different things. But it's a combination of mistrust and strong sense of autonomy, and that leads people to be taken down the path of being misinformed. Um, I want to point out, and I've used this slide in talking to um, unvaccinated employees of, of and companies and other people, vaccination is a personal choice. Um, in China, in the summer of 2020, they were lining millions of people up and injecting them with their experimental vaccines. They didn't have a choice. In the US and most, most countries, it is a choice, but I want to point out, it should be an informed choice. And that's the difference between misinformation and being, being informed and misinformed. Uh, I just want to point this out. Um, this is, I'm not a big basketball fan. Let me see if I can move this over here so it doesn't block my view. Kyrie Irvin, I'm not a big basketball fan, but Kyrie Irvin, Brooklyn Nets, still isn't vaccinated. And this was an article from earlier this week. He said, I gave up four years, a hundred something million dollars deciding to be unvaccinated. His choice, New York City had a, had a rule regulation in place. He had to be vaccinated to basically play professional sports, you know, on, and be in public. He couldn't play home games and he couldn't play, I guess he couldn't go to Toronto either because Canada had a similar rule, couldn't get into Canada. Uh, oops. So who benefits from spreading misinformation? We've got the why people are susceptible to misinformation. Well, this is the other two things I want you to learn or remember, if nothing else, the second half. People are making money on it. It's supposed to be about a billion dollar a year interest for spreading misinformation about healthcare things. And a lot of it's around COVID and a lot of it's around vaccines. And they're selling ads on YouTube. They're selling clicks. They're selling links. They're selling books. They're selling videos. And then the other side of that is those who benefit from civil unrest. Now, we know we've got a pretty small group, like 10 people here. Anybody want to pop on or just unmute and say who might be benefiting from civil unrest in the United States? Somebody unmute and tell, give me the answer. Could it be like foreign adversaries? Give me a name. Uh, <laughs> it's a safe space, right? We could say China or Russia. China or Russia, yay. So this was from just, I think this is today or yesterday, yesterday, the 20, 28th, 27th. Meta shut down co covert influence campaigns run by China and Russia. The belief is that a lot of the vaccine information has been coming out of Russia. Um, this article, I will note, talked about abortion and gun control. It didn't specifically mention vaccines, but I didn't do a lot of digging. But this is something that people have been talking about for a long time. Peter Hotez talks about a lot. And um, yeah, if you're making money or sowing civil unrest, and the two kind of go together, because if you're spewing all sorts of misinformation and somebody can support you covertly, that just furthers their aim too. Um, and then this is from a year, well, August a year ago, about Facebook did an analysis and found that the COVID vaccine mis misinformation was a, one of the most popular things in the platform in the spring of 2021. So how do you combat that? How do you deal with that? You've got autonomy and mistrust basically on the receiving end and money and civil unrest or geopolitical reasons on the, sell on the selling end. So first of all, you gotta understand why people have mistrust. It's really hard to try and alter anybody's sense of autonomy, but you have to understand it's there and respect it. And then you gotta deliver tested messages from trusted sources. And there's something called motivational interviewing. I don't know if we have any psychologists or people come out of that world in the room. They probably understand this a lot better than I do. But this is something the CDC talks about, and it's not unique to vaccine misinformation. It really comes out of sort of opioid um, substance use disorder treatment. And the other thing to note is that there's some research, this is, and it's, it's some place between research and common wisdom, because I haven't been able to track down the original research, but that if somebody's misinformed, 
it takes like five to nine counter messages to try and move them off their belief in the misinformation. And that those, those five to nine counter messaging has to come from a variety of different sources. It can't all come from one source to be effective. Um, so again, you got to figure out the mistrust and get them trusted mess, test messages to work from trusted sources. And using this, what I'm going to talk about, motivational interviewing. Um, I wrote a blog about this. I've been writing blogs for Medscape this year, which is the clinician-facing side of WebMD, if you're not familiar with Medscape. But it was for how clinicians should talk with their patients about their COVID-19 vaccines. And they can come talk more about this in terms of how you address the autonomy of, of the patient, uh, how you approach them. And it's really a motivational interviewing discussion kind of thing. So in terms of trusted sources of information, this is old data, but it's just been, this is the same for, this hasn't changed, that the most highly trusted source of vaccine information is somebody's own doctor or healthcare provider, 85%, right? That's the highest. But what that means is there's 15% of people who don't trust their doctor for information. And that 15% is roughly the same number as the people who are highly resistant or, or hesitant about vaccines. Now, I don't have data that says that's the same 15%, but I would, I'm highly suspicious that there's a strong overlap. Plus, there's also people who don't have a doctor or a healthcare provider. They're just, they don't have a primary care physician. Um, I'm going to skip through some of this. This is more about the doctor and the and partisan divide and demographics and some other things. What I want to point out here is there's a lot of different um, metrics and demographics you can use to look at who wants to get vaccinated, who doesn't. Um, and there's access issues based upon other kinds of racial, ethnic divides. This this I like this slide actually because this shows these are the groups, and this is not 100% obviously, but People wanted to get the vaccine as soon as they could versus those who were highly resistant, didn't want to get it, really weren't sure. Why do I want to go down that little rabbit hole of splitting things out into demographics? Because I said, you've got to find why people are mistrustful and get the messages, messages from trusted sources. This is a landscape analysis I did back in uh, the summer of 2020, August, September, 2020 as it was just before I joined the board of why we vax. And basically what this is, is this is different demographic groups on the, the column here. And then across the top are different ways to communicate messages to people about vaccines, different communication channels, if you will. Um, active social media, passive social media, I'll make that distinction clear in a bit. But then all these other things, the traditional media, membership groups, clinicians, who are a big one, again, the most trusted source in general, community outreach, which is important, uh, celebrities, athletes, clergy, which I think is oftentimes a very underused community resource for communications, employers, um, and the government as well. Um, the red bars over here are the ones that are either, may have higher resistance like young, Amer young adults or be influencers like, like women because uh, women tend to make the health decisions for the entire family and people listen to them for health things. And then the green box is the ones where I thought there was an important opportunity either for uh, activating influencers or a need for getting at some resistant groups. Uh, why we've acts focused in on this active social media and employers. And I can talk more about why we've acts in a bit, but I want to talk about this active social media in a bit. Um, so in terms of how to combat misinformation. Sorry, I'm moving the little box with all your faces on it so I can see. About 50% of people are vaccine resistant because of misinformation. There is a small group that has some religious reasons for being for not getting vaccinated. That's always been around. And actually, I should note, pre-COVID, it was about one to three percent of people um, were sort of anti-vax, vaccine resistant, that tended to be. Um, a certain demographic, and it was pediatric vaccines, what really was the focus. So you can combat the misinformation by cutting off the source of misinformation or reversing the misinformation. Those are kind of the two big buckets of how to address this. Now, cutting off misinformation is tough. And there's been a lot of discussion about why the social media channels, their platforms aren't doing anything. And there's a thing in the United States called the First Amendment 
and all sorts of other laws we can talk about. Uh, I think it's 203B of the Federal Communications Act, or it's 302. I can never remember the right number. Uh, so I really want to talk more about reversing misinformation. But actually, before I go there, I will note that Pinterest, 2019, we were having a measles outbreak in 2019. Nobody remembers that here in, this, in the US. They made the decision, no vaccine information on Pinterest. It's a settled, they, they, I think their exact quote was something like, vaccine science, it, it, it's, it, vaccine safety is a settled science and it's just, we're not gonna allow it on the platform. Now, maybe that wasn't good for the business, but they made that decision. So how do you reverse mis misinformation? I'm gonna talk about this motivational interviewing. And if you look on CDC's website, they've got more information about this. But basically motivational interviewing and conversations is a way to engage with people to address their goals um, and their emotions. It's not uh, like a, a and, and it respects their autonomy. You're engaging them in a conversation as equals or letting them explain to you and trying to identify what their goals are in the for the situation. Um, the, maybe not a, a great example, but I have a friend who actually worked for a big biopharma vaccine company whose mom got coerced by her daughter into being anti-vax. She was convinced it wasn't safe, all these crazy stuff. So my friend, we're trying to figure out what the goals are for his mother that might convince her that getting vaccinated was a good idea. And one was that she was not gonna be able to see her great grandchildren if she didn't get vaccinated because this was back earlier on and the, her great grandchildren were not eligible to be vaccinated, they were too young. That was a goal, that was a motivator. This breaks it down a little simpler sentences, but embracing an attitude of empathy and collaboration, basically you're connecting with the person emotionally in a collaborative way um, and not appealing to their emotions, not factual asking permission, giving, respecting their autonomy to talk about the vaccines and using scaled questions. This is a bit of a technique moving towards their openness um, and responding to questions, not dumping information. Because one thing that this kind of upsets some people when we talk about it, has anybody heard of the blowback effect in vaccines, anything like this? It's a little bit controversial because there's been some, you know, the research is not purely all on one side, but this is pre-COVID, this is about pediatric vaccines, but basically by telling people, parents that, you know, who are resistant or concerned about vaccines and pre-COVID, it was really the safety and there was a big autism thing that's continued to go on and on. But by just sort of dumping all this information and assurances about how safe the vaccines are, you could actually make the person more resistant and less likely to get vaccinated. And the best way I can explain this is, it's like they had concerns about safety of the vaccines and you were explaining to them all the reasons why the vaccines were safe, all the data and everything else. But what that did was it just rang that safety bell in their head even harder and louder. So they came in, it was ringing a little bit, they left there, it was ringing harder. That made them more resistant, it's called the blowback effect. So just because you think something looks good, it may have a counter, it may have the unintended consequences of the opposite effect you were looking for. So how to combat misinformation again? Uh, as I just wrote, this is a little repetitive, but there's the 15% who've got strongly held misinformation and they need a focus group, uh, individual specific messages. This is a whole, you've probably seen this, this is a list of a lot of the common misinformation and questions ranging from, microchips and COVID caused by 5G to natural immunity is better than vaccination. And somebody asked me about, during the Q&A, somebody asked me about measles and natural immunity, please. Somebody write that down. I think that I write that down? Yeah. Um, this is the matrix again. The re reason I'm bringing this back up again is I'm gonna talk about this, why we vax an issue we tried to launch for this, we're calling active social media. Because passive social media is like, CNN or the NIH or CDC or or Peter Hotez or you know the American Public Health Association American Pediatrics putting stuff out on their website about how great vaccines are at Georgetown University uh, the people who have been misinformed that's not the social media they're looking at they're in these echo chambers 
of misinformation spread. The people are making money, have sucked them in, have kept them there, and are reinforcing that misinformation. So what we created was this, um, this initiative we tried to launch called iStar. Um, it wasn't my idea, but I did come up with a name. As you guys know, when you got to come up with an acronym that sounds good and means something for legislation or programs, the Immunization SWAT Team Application for Rapid Response. So really what it was, was a real-time group of volunteers who could be, go into those echo chambers of social media discussions where vaccine misinformation was being bandied about and reinforced and respond to it and try and cha change the direction of the conversation, get people off of the misinformation. And I don't know if we have any techies in the group because this is way beyond my knowledge base, but this is the basic schematic of how it was gonna work. There was gonna be a website or an app where people could go in, sign in, and they'd be directed to these channels, these, these, these discussion groups of misinformation, people who were spreading it, and they would be provided with curated information, articles, text, videos, images, and the whole thing would be moderated. And they would go in and try and change the conversation, basically. Um, I, I can talk more about this. Uh, I can't remember how many more slides I have. All right, I've got a few more, but we basically had a, an alpha test with a group of college students in January 2021 who tested this manually without the app using things like a swarm, swarm tactic, which basically gets at that five to nine message, counter messaging. Instead of just having one person say, hey, I don't think this is right, or maybe you should look, do you think about this, or questioning it in that sort of motivational interviewing tactic, we'd had multiple students go in and try and figure out or, and, and reinforce each other's messages. They also were researching different social media platforms, Twitter, um, a Twitter TikTok, Reddit, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram were the six. And they came up with some very interesting findings about the different tone of conversations in each of those platforms and, and how the people responded. It was really very interesting. I can talk more about this if you want, about why it never happened um, and why almost nobody's doing anything. At the time, in early, late 2020, nobody's doing anything like this. There's a couple of things that are sort of like this, but not um, anything technologically like this where it could be scaled. So just let me uh, wrap up here so we can get to the Q&A because I think I've taken more than my 15 minutes. Vaccines don't work without vaccinations. One of the mantras I've been beating the drum on for any organizations, including why we vax, that are trying to do, make difference in this, that the only real metric that matters is moving the needle and moving needles into arms. Everything else, unless it helps change that metric, doesn't matter. Unless you're getting people vaccinated, doesn't matter. So without herd immunity, we've got effective control. Uh, everybody's doing good things, trying to make things better. This is what people have been doing since the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, there are some newer vaccines and treatments in the, in the works, obviously. Uh, I also want to note, if there's any immunologists in, in, in the room, in the virtual room, you know, the immune system is very complex and robust. We can talk more about that, what that means for misinformation and vaccines as well. Um, one of the new, one of the misinformation tropes was that vaccines cause, COVID vaccines cause infertility. And that was really, um, I should say, I guess I didn't say this before, a lot of the misinformation tropes have some nugget of truth, as Stephen Colbert, truthiness in a way. And the truthiness or the nugget of truth that the infertility came from was that for a significant number of women who get COVID vaccinations, uh, it changes their menstrual cycle temporarily. And that was just some research that came out today showing, yeah, it does. But that's not a shock because menstrual cycles can change. People get sick, get a fever, all sorts of reasons. It wasn't a shock that the reaction people got from the vaccine caused changes the menstrual cycle, which were temporary. Um, so again, uh, I'm just gonna repeat this. Misinformation about vaccines in science, autonomy and mistrust, they mistrust large organizations and experts and promoting misinformation, making money, civil unrest. And to, re and to do this and to try and reverse misinformation in small groups or individuals, you have conversations, not lectures, um, discussions that are motivational appeal to a person's goals and emotions. Really what that comes down to is what I call retail messaging, 
not mass medias. And, you know, through a lot of the pandemic and even now, a lot of organizations doing these big ads and uh, on the media. And I just don't think it's all that effective. I have not seen good evidence that it's really moving that needle on the metric of moving needles into arms. So I'm going to conclude there and thank you. I always like to use this picture of my friend's daughter who got vaccinated, particularly because it's got the My Little Pony mask. Um, and you can just tell she's smiling underneath that mask and she's got the big thumbs up. And these are some other topics we can talk about. I didn't really talk about the difference between misinformation, disinformation, or long COVID, but um, I'm going to, I guess, try and stop sharing if I can figure out how to do that. Uh, new share, stop share. I did it. It did, the computer didn't crash. So thank you guys. Um, and is there, are there things in the, the mask is adorable, the immunologist, but obviously relevant. What a loaded, what's a loaded, Emily, what's a loaded question? Oh, and towards the beginning of your presentation, when you're asking like, you know, who, who benefits from this misinformation? Oh, okay. Like, okay. Yes, that is, a, that was a loaded <laughs> question. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> so, um, you know, we've got another, I, I always want to leave a lot of time for questions. We've got at least 25 minutes. So open, open your questions, turn your screen on, on, on mute. Um, just, oh, uh, I see uh, some raised hands. Um, Alinda, do you want to unmute yourself and ask a question? Yeah, hi, thank you so much. That was really, really interesting um, presentation. Um, you know, the, the point about sort of like, you know, communicating with people sort of like goals and like not lecturing at them is really well taken, um, but those feel very individual to me from sort of like a, policy perspective, is there anything about, you know, just to use the example of the COVID vaccine, like the rollout of that, that you think could have been done better in a way that would have reduced vaccine hesitancy? Um, I'm sure there are things that could have been done better. Um, I, 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 I think, and I didn't try, when I said before, there are a lot of organizations doing these mass media. There's a few organizations that I'm sure we're doing things local on the ground. There's one organization called the Black Coalition Against COVID. I don't know if it's still in existence. It was sort of done in partnership with an organization of blackdoctors.org, I think. But they were looking both to provide information from leading black clinicians and, and organize things at the community level. That's really where it's got to happen. It's like, I was trying to go out and offer to talk to employers and community groups or anything else. But, and I'm gonna say something that is sort of both very obvious, but a little bit on PC. I can go to Wisconsin, I can go to upstate New York, I can go to a variety of Minnesota and Kansas and Oklahoma. I'm not the person to talk to groups in Miami or San Antonio or Atlanta. I'm not the right demographic. Um, and that's just the reality. I mean, the marketing people have known this concept for years and years. When I was doing work uh, after I left Pfizer, I guess, but still doing some work connected with them, the marketing people always wanted, the salespeople wanted brochures about all these different programs with pictures for the demographics of the community in which they were working. It's just, that's the reality. So you've got to have that local connection. So I think there could have been more of a recognition of that. Um, I think, how do I say this? I think the, the iStar initiative never launched for two reasons. One, why we vax never got any money to fund it. And two, um, I was made aware through a friend, uh, through some connections about the high risk for lawsuits, for defamation. Basically, uh, if it became known that that YWVAX was organizing this thing to send people en masse into these channels of, of social media where people were making a lot of money and challenging them, even though what, everything they're saying was true, doesn't prevent the, that person from suing uh, YWVAX for defamation and I was told that can take um, about four months of litigation and cost two to three hundred thousand dollars per case. Um, yeah, exactly. I mean, somebody and Mabel's raising her eyebrows. 
Um, and I tried to find others who could take this on, who had more resources, but I couldn't find anybody who was uh, risk tolerant enough to do it. And, you know, you've probably seen some of it like Facebook and some of the other ones. I, my social media is mostly Facebook, a little bit of Twitter, uh, maybe know some more, but they've said, oh, they put, you know, the flagging misinformation stuff. But the reality is those platforms, they're making money. The more stuff happens, the more water through the, through the spigot, the more money they make. So they have a disincentive to try and reduce things. Uh, on the policy side, again, there is there is that discussion, and I think some members of Congress have recently reopened this around, I think it's Section 203 of the Federal Communications Act. Maybe somebody else will know. But basically, that provision is written now, and again, I'm really not an expert in this, but it basically says that those social media platforms are just platforms, and they are not responsible for anything that goes on there. Unlike you know, I'm going to age myself, the old school networks, ABC, CBS, they're responsible for what goes out over the air. They're liable if they put out something that's problematic or run some ads that are really, even the ads, I think they they have to control somewhat. So you asked me if there are policy things to do. I think there are things that could have been done to try and promote more granular discussion. And that landscape analysis I, I did I was sharing that with everybody because that's what I think how the world should have been approached for getting out granular communications. I mean, it's kind of silly, and I'll shut up in a sec, but political campaigns know this. That's how they operate. They operate on these different demographics, different neighborhoods and everything else and local organizing. And the public health people didn't, you know, get a grip on it. Um, you know, the CDC wrote a literal, a literal book, about 140 pages, I think on how to communicate during public health crisis. Came out in the, or I think the latest version was the early mid 2000s. But you know, it's worse, they weren't, it wasn't specific for this kind of big public health emergency. It was meant to be more local. So um, I can't, I don't know who asked that question. Anna maybe, but I hope that answered it mostly. And I'll be quiet so we can get to another question. Carol, do you, are she next? Sure. Yeah. Um, so I'm I'm curious more about the content of the messaging. Um, so one issue with science communication broadly is scientists have more of a like risk tolerance. Um, we understand probability, uncertainty better. And when you're communicating a message about like, say the safety of the vaccines without saying it's black and white, it's 100% safe for every single person with zero risk for anyone, like that the message just like, want, like maybe that's speaking to your um, backfire effect or what, whatever it was blowback. called. Maybe, maybe, blowback, maybe, it is, but, maybe it is backfire. I thought it was blow, I think it's blowback, but it could I be backfire. I think it's blowback, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, um, but um, yeah, can you speak to that? <sighs> Yeah, I'm going to I'm going to give you a really controversial kind of answer. That the people who have been misinformed are not going to respond to the facts. They don't like the experts. And 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 it's almost this whole culture of alternative facts. My belief is just as good as your facts. So, this is an analogy I haven't used very often, but I'm going to use it here and I hope it's inoffensive. Rather than convincing somebody with facts, you have to woo them. Like you're convincing them to go out on a date with you or move in with you. It's, emotion, it's, it's an emotional-based engagement. And I'll reference back to the blog I wrote for, for the clinicians. And this all started actually with my own primary care uh, clinician as a nurse practitioner. And she said to me, I was there for my annual, you know, wellness visit. We spent most of it talking about COVID vaccines. It was June of 2021. How do I deal with the patient who just, you know, I say, do you want to talk about the, I want to talk about the COVID vaccines? And they say, don't, not going to get it. Don't want to talk about it. Case closed. How do you not let the door be slammed shut and locked? How do you keep the conversation going? And that was one reason I wrote that blog. And it was, seeding 
the authority to the patient to explain back to the clinician why that feel that why they feel that way explain literally say to the patient i told her okay i understand i appreciate that but can you help me so when i have other patients who have similar feelings i can understand what they're thinking what they're going can you explain to me now that doesn't mean that they're going to explain to go oh yeah you know light bulb i'm going to get vaccinated but it keeps the conversation going. Similarly, um, I had a, I did a, a talk for 300 employees of this big government contractor back when contractors were under a mandate to get everybody vaccinated. And they had about 300 people who hadn't been vaccinated. And they did, I was I did a, a, a Q&A a presentation, very brief, like 10 minute presentation and Q&A. And I fought with them about how to format it. And they insisted these WebEx, you know, that's our platform, blah, blah. And they did it as a webinar. And so all the, there was the pre, there were four squares of people on the screen, me, the president of the company, the head of HR, and the moderator. The moderator was fine. But all the questions were submitted via the chat. And then the moderator read them. We did the debrief. And I kind of had to yell at the president and the head of HR because I tried to get him to do something like this where it's a meeting. And we did another one. Like, of three weeks later, where, where people could turn on the screen and ask, because I had to explain to them sort of in real granular, gritty detail, the, the president and the head of HR, that the goal you want is you want to move people from, I don't want to get vaccinated, I, I hate vaccinations, I hate the government, I hate biopharma, and I hate this company, I hate you, and I'm going to quit or get fired because I hate you so much. You want to move them over that line to I don't want to get vaccinated. I hate the government. I hate vaccines. I hate, you know, biopharm companies. And I hate you, company. And I hate you, president. But you listen to me. And so I'm going to get vaccinated so I don't have to quit my job or get fired. You don't want to move them to like, I love you. And, you know, want to wax your car every Sunday. You just want to get them vaccinated so they don't. you don't have to fire them enough to quit. And the way to do that is let them be on screen and let them ask their questions so they feel like they've been heard. That's what a lot of people want. They want to feel like they've been hurt. That's really a first step. So yeah, the scientist's intuition is, I've got all this great data. I got all these great facts. I want to just boom, 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 throw it at you. You've got to sort of rein that back in. And when people ask you about that, do you know? Or maybe throw in a little nugget here or there. Or I've heard. It's really an emotional discussion engagement. Does that make sense? It's not easy. It's not intuitive for people who are super type A, you know, fact nerds. And I'm right there. You know, I've been accused of mansplaining almost anything. Um, but to piggyback a little bit on on what you were saying, you you mentioned your during your presentation that it takes five to nine um, counter messages to meet someone. Um, for the relief of misinformation? Does it take the same amount of reinforcement or just like hearing the misinformation message to believe something that's not true? And can we learn something from that as well? That's a, that's a good point. Um, I'm not sure. And again, that five to nine is what I call the common wisdom. I did about a year ago, try and track down like the psychological research, the social science research on that. I really couldn't find anything. Uh, I keep asking people if they know, and it's I get sort of shrugs. In terms of making people misinformed, it's it's kind of similar. It's from trusted sources, and it buys into their belief system. And again, that misinformation always starts with a little nugget of truth. Because as Carol, who's still on the screen, knows, oh, you, you can leave your camera on, Carol. The science is really complicated sometimes, and the immune system is crazy complicated. Somebody said they're uh, Nicole said she's an immunologist. I, I can tell my immunologist joke in a minute. The immune system is really, really complicated. And, you know, everybody's been focused in on antibodies, but that's just like the first layer of a really complicated multi cell, multi matrix kind of system that, you know, tr immuno immunologists don't understand how it works, but everybody in the PTA thinks they do or the town council. So yeah, the, the other thing to recognize, and this is uh, whoever asked the question about how what could have been done with the vaccine rollout 
to make things better. It's a lot easier to inform somebody who's uninformed than it is to change somebody to uh, undo the misinformation. So I think if there'd been a lot more work at the beginning, and you got to remember the vaccines are being developed in the past administration, which was not known for its great truthful communications and organizational abilities. So I worked for, actually my job at NIH, I worked for Tony Fauci, it was my second job in Washington, my first job after the fellowship, who was a terrific communicator, but man, was he biting his lip a lot of times. <laughs> um, he's a great guy and he's really good, not just at the science and the administration, but he's a really good communicator. And, you know, it's just. Um, I've seen that um, Cynthia had his hand up for a while. So I want to, Give him a little bit of time to ask a question. Yeah, sorry, I'm, I tend to give long answers. I apologize. <laughs> no, it's all good. Um, so how often, like you asked a question and I said China and Russia, and that was the next slide. How often does that, that happen? <laughs> I don't know. I'm giving a, a somewhat similar talk on Friday to some <laughs> chemistry majors. Uh, it, 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 as somebody said, duh, um, it, it, it was at you? I don't know. It. It's not. It's not. Particularly since Ukraine, it's not. You know, not obvious. It's a pretty obvious answer. And I, I do have a follow up to that. So, sure. before the Ukraine conflict, was it as easy to to identify those kind of adversaries to the general public? Right. Like uh, so. Has Russian have Russia and China been doing this for years? Yeah. Yeah, yes. And and frankly, the United States is probably doing it too in a different way. I mean, you know, the US has been, I'm not, I, I, foreign policy is not my area. I've got friends in the foreign service and other stuff. And I, I do really most of the domestic health stuff. But, you know, there's been stories of the United States and other Western countries doing all sorts of stuff. The stories about US and Central America and misinformation, meddling in politics and stuff. So it's not unique to Russia and China. But it's a it's a different it's a less obvious and less directly it's it's a form of hacking. They're not turning off electric. They're not turning off power stations. They're changing people's minds. You know they're they're doing stuff. So I, I want to try and be a little bit balanced here. And the NSA yeah. will probably be at my front door tomorrow morning. So <laughs> for sure. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, who's up next? Uh, Rashmina. Hi, um, thank you for such an interesting conversation. I wanted to follow up on what seems to be like a foundational um, assumption of a lot of your slides, but is a little unusual for me, which is that misinformation is inherently lucrative. Could you kind of go over why, why that's happening? Why is giving people the wrong information about a scientific fact so, like, so easy to well, make money with? There's there's two there's there's the there's the social media plat channels the Dr. Marcola, um, um, other so some couple celebrities uh, I, I've got a, actually I don't, didn't I put the slide in this deck I've got the one I use on Friday because I'm going to dig deeper they've got millions of followers on YouTube on Facebook on Twitter there you know there are uh, this guy Dr. I think it's Marcola has got videos he's got um, you know books he's selling. And part of the reason why he, they can't just kick him off Facebook. Like, you know, the Facebook just kicked Robert Kennedy off Facebook because he, good on the environment, bad on vaccines. His sister was actually on the board of YWVAX because his whole family just hates what he does and the whole vaccine stuff. That really drives him nuts. Um, so he's selling not just anti-vax stuff, but he's got all this alternative health stuff. Um, I've got names for it, but since we're recording, I won't say what I call it because it, it get other people mad at me. Um, so there's that. But, if, but then if you're Facebook or Instagram or Twitter, the more traffic you have, the better it is for you. Because if 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 Dr. Mercola or some of these other people, Jenny McCarthy, have lots of traffic through their channels and there are ads in those channels, Jenny McCarthy, Dr. McCullough, all these other people, Rob Schneider, these are a couple of actors. Um, they get money from the ads, but the platform gets money from the ads too. And the reason why like people like Mercola and others haven't been kicked off as easily as, as Robert Kennedy is 
it, it's the, it's not just COVID vaccine, it's not vaccine specific. So it's harder for them to say, all of this is junk, you're gone. But I think if section 203 or 302 of the FCC Act um, was changed and made those platforms liable for misinformation and the harms, the actual harms they were doing. And I've got a whole thesis on this, it's not gonna happen soon because those platforms are hugely influential and the politics are so wrong for doing something like this. But I think there's a precedent for it. And I think there's a good rational argument for it. Um, but I don't see it happening soon. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And I kind of have a follow on if Mabel will let me um, jump in for one more minute. Um, well, hopefully we'll be able to get past COVID at some point, but part of me feels like there's it's going to be endemic. There's been like a level of irreparable harm that's been done to like our public health infrastructure because of the amount of misinformation. What are the ripple on effects that you could see of the way that COVID and um, yeah, yeah. No, coronavirus I, has been handled for like vaccinations going forward? That's that's a great question. And the the harm is that the anti-vax and anti-science has become more mainstream-ish. And certainly, and particularly in certain areas, uh, slide I skipped over, and there's been data. There's now there did uh, there never used to be a partisan divide in like flu vaccination rates. Now there is. Republicans are less likely to get vaccinated than Democrats. Um, and you know, like I said, anti-vax stuff used to be one to three percent, and it was primarily um, it was primarily very upper income suburban moms about their kids. The highest vaccination rates for pediatric vaccines pre-COVID was in West Virginia and Mississippi because there's no Marin County, there's no Westchester, there's no Gold Coast of Chicago in those states. That's where these people who are anti-vax pre-COVID. Now we've got like 15% and it's bleeding over into anti-science, anti all sorts of stuff. I did a presentation for medical device companies. They were smaller companies in the spring about, about how to develop evidence and data and value. And we did some polling as part of it. And I stuck one in there. So I talked about the anti-vax stuff I'd done. I asked them, have they heard of in, anti, you know, science, anti misinformation about their products? And I asked, is it the same as it was pre-COVID? Has it gotten better? Has it gotten worse? And 17% said it had gotten worse. More misinformation. This is medical devices. Who would have thunk it? And Peter, Peter, do you guys know who Peter Hotez is? Somebody I know. He, I, he was on a panel. I moderated a thing and known him. He was actually involved in a little bit getting why we back started. He's not involved directly, but he's written a book. And, and this discussion we had at this World Vaccine Congress in April in DC, this panel was not about COVID vaccines as much as vaccines in general and anti science. And the ripple effect is if you're a company or you're researchers, you're looking for funding you know, funding the NIH, you're looking to sell your products in an, in an environment where my beliefs are as good as your facts, that, you know, is a problem. And I have a cousin who's a little bit in that way. She's kind of an unreconstructed hippie, but she'll go to regular doctors and stuff. But she went to a clairvoyant diagnostician for her knee pain. Thankfully, it wasn't, it wasn't Lyme and it got better. She just had hurt her knee. <laughs> but, you know, that was, and she got some crazy diagnosis and take, took a bunch of herbal stuff and um, she's great, but that, that was okay. But in other cases, it can be very problematic, like Aaron Rodgers. Um, and I'll, I know we're running out of time, but you know, he said he, he got immunized. He went through a homeopathic regimen that he thought boosted his immune system. That was his immunization. So I'm sorry, Mabel, let's go to somebody next. I'll stop ranting. Yeah, I know that um, we're almost out of time, but let's see if we can I, I can stay. I don't know about anybody else. But. Yeah, Stan and, and Nicole had a question. And I do want to talk about measles, too, before we, before we sign off. Go ahead, Christine. Hi, hi. Um, hey. Yeah, thank you for taking the time to speak with us. Um, so my- it's That retail <laughs> messaging, and I'm, I'm virally spreading that through all of you to all of your contacts. <laughs> yes, definitely. Um, so my question sort of has to do with, um, so basically, you know, 
it seems like misinformation and disinformation can spread very rapidly through the channels of social media, but then it takes this very like personalized um, sort of, uh, you know, approach to counteract that misinformation where you're trying to have these like conversations with individual people. So it seems to be very unbalanced in terms of like what we can do to fight, which is what is essentially a very uphill battle. So I guess I'm sort of wondering if there are like preventative measures that we should be taking as a society to sort of try to engender trust in science, like maybe something that can be embedded in the public school system to try to like combat some of this before it starts? Like, is that a viable approach? Well, there's been a lot of discussion about that, teaching people science, kids science earlier as a scientific approach and, and trying to do that. Um, I will say that that was the beauty of iStar, was trying to nip the misinformation at the bud, trying to keep people from getting misinformed or get them off misinformation, going right where they were getting misinformation. Um, and the other preventative thing is, I, I referenced this before, make those who are spreading the misinformation and hurting people and enabling that to be spread, make them liable. Sorry, something's clanging. Um, you know, uh, I, I liken it to the creation of the FDA. The FDA was created because people were selling stuff that was killing people, or hurting people. There's a whole history of that. I don't know if any of you guys are in the, that world, but it's 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 on the FDA's website about the the stuff people were selling that was toxic and poisonous and things. So, um, but I agree completely. But it's not easy. Unfortunately, this World Vaccine Congress panel on misinformation that we had. In April, I mean, the, the panel of experts, Peter and some other people, um, guy from Harvard, guy from Georgetown, and somebody from, I can't remember where the other couple people were from, but the consensus was, this is not a war that's gonna be easily won. Uh, there's no like magic bullet and it's getting, it's just getting worse. The trend is in the wrong direction. Partly because we're an open society, we've got the first amendment and these other countries, you know, have been doing bad things and continue to do it. So thank you for the question. Thank you all for the questions. Nicole, you're the immunologist. You're gonna get a question. I'll keep it quick. Um, so I think a lot of people in the SciComm space really talk about um, you know, being very empathetic and providing personal stories to try to combat um fear or to demonstrate that maybe you yourself were concerned or unsure about um mm -hmm. a vaccine or a therapy, but sort of helping people understand your logic and why you ended up doing it. I'm curious about your thoughts about when that may not quite be appropriate. Um, I'll say that my placement is in legislative affairs. And so when you're in a situation where it's a very professional space, you're working with a member of Congress or their staff, something like that, what then do you use um, rather than bombarding them with the scientific information but that would be a little more personal without crossing that line. Uh, I worked as a lobbyist for Pfizer for five and a half years. I worked on the Hill, I, you know, I, I've been in the world. If you've got a member of Congress, a, a, um, I'm trying to think who has been really outspoken, Rand Paul, so he's, the, he's the guy who's been yelling at Tony all these years, last two years, right? Isn't that, they got that right? Um, so you're, you're meeting with somebody and they're just yelling at you about the science is wrong and the masks are wrong. You keep changing your name. You're like, you're, you don't know what you're talking about. You keep changing your story, blah, blah, blah. You know, the dynamic and the power, the power dynamic if, uh, in a professional setting where you've got a member of Congress or their staff, you know, I worked as a staffer, I worked as a lobbyist. You know, you're essentially in legislative affairs, you're a lobbyist for the NIH. It's like, yes, Senator, yes, Congressman, yes, you know, San, Sandy, Sammy, staffer. Um, I understand completely. Thank you so much for telling me your perspectives. You're not gonna change their mind. And, and your role, frankly, there is not to. You're there is to provide information. You know, and then you go drink heavily. I'm sorry. You know, I'm sorry. Um, you go to the Irish Times or the Dublin or or Tortilla Coast or whatever is still there. Um, I, and 
you, you know, it's it's not it, it, that's that it's a professional setting where it's not your job to do that. Um, you know, it's like if you're a, an entrepreneur and you're pitching a venture capitalist and they ask you something that's completely outside the realm of your business. It's like, well, that's not my job to, to answer that question to provide the information. And frankly, from the other side, I how do I say this? How long have you been in ledge affairs? Um, a month. Okay. So this is off topic, but I think it might be useful for you. Their job is not to be spreading the truth. Their job is to get reelected. And frankly, right now, their job is to try and win the majority. In the Senate, particularly, where it's a little more of a coin flip, the House, who knows what the hell's going to happen. It's, it's The common wisdom is the Republicans are going to take the House because they only, they only need to win so few seats. But so for those members of Congress and their staff and their campaign people, um, I can tell lots of stories about this. The truth doesn't matter. What matters is winning the election and winning the majority. So what they're saying to you, what they're saying publicly, and the other thing is what they're saying privately may be very different than what they're saying publicly. But you, but they've created a whole mass. I mean, the president, the former president, clarify that, you know, trying to take credit for the vaccine and getting booed by his biggest fans. They've been so misinformed. They're going to boo their 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 you know their leader so but nicole since you're on i would do want to talk about immunology for one sec because we're all science nerds and i do need to put this out there so you guys know about it and it's the whole concept of natural immunity is better than you know vaccinations measles if you get infected with measles it has the effect of erasing your immune memory Good, and thank you for shaking your head, Nicole. And more research just came out about this recently, about why. This was known last 10, 15 years. People weren't sure why. It was seen in developing countries where these kids would get vaccinated for all sorts of stuff, but not measles. They get measles, and then they were dying at higher rates and contracting these diseases they'd already been vaccinated against. What was discovered, I think, in the last year or two is that the measles virus, when you get infected, somehow kills off or suppresses or neutralizes um memory b cells so it, it shuts down that memory store for producing antibodies against all this stuff that you've been exposed to already so that is a complete you know in your face that natural immunity is better than than vaccinations um and it's part of the the joke i have about how immunologists you know it's so complicated immunologists don't understand how the immune system works it's a longer joke but I, we were running out of, we're out of time so i won't go in there um, but I, I'm I can, I'm more than willing to stay, and this is what I told you know people have had me talk to their employees and everything else. I'm willing to stay for as long as people want to listen and talk because that's people want to be heard and people want their questions answered. Um, and it's only eight thirty my time. So, but thank you guys for having me. Um, thank you for being for being fellows for doing a bit of a career pivot for some of you. Um, you know, we need more people with the knowledge base in the policy world, which is why the fellowship program was started originally. Is it 50 years ago now? It's close to that, isn't it? One of my one of my chemistry professors was one of the first fellows back many years ago. And that's how I ended up in the fellowship program. He told stories about it. Well, thank you. Um, I know we're a little bit of our time. Um, so I just want to thank everyone um, for for your questions. I, I want to thank Dr. Miller for his great talk and, and the conversation. I know that um Rich, and thank you. And, and I apologize and I hope you guys weren't freaking out too bad when my screen just went blank and I left for, for oh, that's, you know, yeah that's perfectly okay. I know that Rich <laughs> had some some closing remarks but um I, I, after that, if someone wants to stay and ask a question, we can leave it. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so why I suggest we do is after I do my little little bitty spiel, um, Anahid, why didn't we turn off the recording and then anyone who wants to can stay off mic?